Glory to God. So as you're joining us, share this broadcast, invite your followers, and blessings to you. Happy New Year to all. Greetings to you. We give God all the glory for everything. We praise God. Understanding the law of the thousandfold and the hundredfold. Understanding this law. These are this this is a supernatural. Law in the spirit, understanding this law of the hundredfold and the thousandfold. Now, imagine this, saints. Isaiah is a rich prophet that's prophesying riches. He prophesies about the death of Jesus in Isaiah 53. But then he prophesies about wealth and riches in Isaiah 45. Well, that was even before Isaiah 53. And Isaiah 60 and Isaiah 61. He's prophesying about the riches and the wealth of God. And it's contrary to what a lot of people will tell you because they'll tell you that you can't prophesy money, you can't prophesy wealth. But these men of God were doing it. So what spirit were they of? And so that knocked all that, that discussion out because they was preaching finances. Now, Isaiah, with him being a rich prophet, imagine Isaiah knows this financial anointing of God. He knows how it operates. He knows that it, it is real. He knows that it functions and once it functions, it takes the child of God outside of being normal in your lifestyle. You can't live an average lifestyle when you step into this. And the Lord is going to supply you with money, going to supply you with finances. He going to take good care of you lavishly. And Isaiah is prophesying this to the people of God, that this realm is real. That there's a there's a dimension in God where Gentiles, unsaved people, people that are not serving the Lord will come and bring you money. Every child of God need to hear this. So Isaiah is a rich prophet. He has dominion over money. He has dominion over finances. He has dominion over the wealth of God. And he's moving in this on the earth. And God is having him introduce other people to this. God is having him tell other people about this system where wealth flows. Where wealth is made accessible and given to the child of God. Once again, uh, Deuteronomy chapter, Deuteronomy chapter one, verse 11. It says, the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more and blesses you even as he has promised. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more and blesses you. even as he has promised three different realms of supply. The realm of supply of blessing, the realm of supply of the thousandfold, and the realm of supply of the promise. These are three different sections where the father supplies you. He supplies you through the thousandfold, the blessing, and then he supplies you through the promise. All of these three realms is flowing when you're listening to God and his wisdom. All of these three realms. Now, saints, once again, the Bible declared that the Lord God of your fathers, see, you got to be very, very careful that you don't make Lazarus your father. 
Because Lazarus is what a lot of church people and religious people want you to be like beggars. You store up treasures in heaven. You're going to suffer right now. You're going to be without all this stuff because it's of the world. Now, mind you, I will never understand the level of stupid to define how money and things are of the world when God created everything for his perfect pleasure. I'll never understand that level of stupid. How things that God said that everything in the earth belongs to me in Psalm 24. Everything belongs to me. I don't understand how it's of the world. He gives you all things to richly enjoy. And so if you're going to get here and live this type of realm, there's a sanctification that's going to be demanded of you. Like you can't hang around people that think like that. Oh man, because they are wealth anointing quenchers. You can't move in the money mantles of the Lord Jesus Christ around wealth anointing quenchers. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to really break away from those type of people and you're gonna have to do it fast. Don't assemble yourself around people that don't believe in God's economy because you telepathically you're gonna link up with their thoughts. And no angel will minister God's provisional system to you when your thoughts are bad. When they're stinking thinking, when you're against that flow of God, you can't walk in it. Isaiah is prophesying riches and wealth. And then Isaiah prophesies, I believe in Isaiah 45 verse 11. He said, command ye me the work of my hands. He's talking about what the father is saying. As a matter of fact, let's go there. Command ye me the work of my hands. Now, saints, imagine the father telling you to command ye him the work of his hands. Why would the father have to tell you that? Because most times you are alienated from those work of his hands and it'll cause you to suffer financially. It'll cause you to suffer in your health. It'll cause you to suffer in your Your lifestyle. Isaiah 45. Verse 11. He says. Command ye me the work of my hands. Commanding this covenant promise. For the thousand fold. Commanding this covenant promise. For the thousand fold. For the hundred fold. You have rights. To command this thousand fold blessing upon yourself. Because it's a part of what the Lord said you will have. So it's not something that you just thinking up and making up. The Lord said I'll bless you a thousand times more. But see you have to command this blessing. Remember the Lord had Moses command the blessing upon the children of Israel. Remember um, had him... Uh, Say the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you, the Lord be gracious to you, lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Now saints, when he said the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord blessing you is the Lord making you rich. Because that's what the blessing does. So imagine Moses is, is declaring over them, may the Lord make you rich. May he empower you to be financial dominators. May he anoint you for wealth. May he give you grace to be rich, prosper you in riches. Wow. 
Wow. This is um, this is amazing. This is amazing. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Look what it says right here in verse. Wow. And he that gathered little had no lack. Wow. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to read this in another 2 Corinthians. Now, saints, imagine that you have a superior financial covenant than this world. That is really supposed to be you living the way that a lot of times you see people boasting about. That's really your that's really your lifestyle. That's really the realm in the spirit that you're supposed to be dominating in. That's really how you're supposed to be functioning. Just like that. In that same aspect. Now let's go here. It says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Verse 14. It says at the present time your plenty will supply what they need. So that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, verse 15, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. What he's talking about here is that there's a balance. In this text, is also dealing with investors. He's saying, y'all supply, y'all supply, and it's an equality. Nobody is lacking. Which is what happened in Acts chapter 4. Everybody took on the mindset of giving, and nobody was having a financial struggle. See, this is a mindset, though. When Moses said the Lord bless you, it wasn't just the Lord make you rich, but he was also talking about a riches mindset, a mindset that is empowered by the spirit of God. It's different. It's not the same way that everybody thinks. This mindset is saturated with the economy of God, his package, his wealth. The blessing is a mind mantle. It makes your mind go in a direction concerning the wisdom of God, concerning provision. It makes your mind think a certain way. And it causes you to exit out of the demon of lack. Now, let me say this here. Remember what the word of God said? That my, pe my people perish for lack of knowledge. Now imagine this. I want to say this to you and think about this. It says my people perish for lack. The demon of lack is creating the perishing. And watch this. My people perish for lack of knowledge. The demon of lack is keeping the knowledge from getting to you. That can stop you from perishing. The demon of lack is responsible for keeping you away from hearing the gospel that will stop the perishing from happening in your health, in your wealth, in your finances, in your money situation. So it's actually the demon of lack 
that is filtering the message that God wants you to hear and say, no, no, don't hear that. No, no, don't listen to that. No, 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 this is not of God. Is the demon of lack doing that? Saints, this is powerful. The demon of lack creates disinterest in the wisdom for the wisdom of God. The demon of lack creates disinterest for the knowledge of God, for the blessing of God. See, when the demon of lack is over people's life, they will hate the idea of the thousandfold, the hundredfold, money cometh, supernatural money, supernatural provision, sowing and reaping, seed time and harvest. They will hate what Jesus preached. It's the demon of lack that keeps the message of the gospel from penetrating where you need to hear it so that you'll stay in a perishing cycle. So he said, my people perish for the lack. Before we deal with knowledge, it is the demon of lack that's stopping the knowledge from getting to you. So imagine the demon of lack filtering the impartation that you need to come out of debt. Or the demon of lack filtering the information you need to come out of borrowing. Or the demon of lack filter. Saints, if you look back at your life, why did you not have what you were supposed to have? The demon of lack was, was right there standing, blocking you from embracing what you needed to embrace. And this demon of lack is so crafty that it creates an anger in you when God wants you to know something. The demon of lack makes you judge and critique what you need to pay attention to is all the demon of lack. And watch this. When the demon of lack stop the knowledge from getting to you, now you're lacking financially. You're lacking in wisdom. You're lacking in knowledge. You're lacking in provision. You're lacking in joy. You're lacking in peace. You're lacking in progress. You're lacking in promotion. Because that's what that demon of lack came to do. It, raise, it arouses you up. And then after you're aroused up, you, you forfeit what's supposed to come to you. Imagine after you done got riled up, you done, and, and watch this, the demon of lack is the author of offense. Saints, if you watch people that lose favor, lose provision, lose divine opportunities, it is people that get offended. People that get offended lose the most golden doors because of offense. The spirit of lack will make you offended and as a result of you getting offended, now you leave where God wants you to be. It's the demon of lack. Because after you got offended, look at where you're at. You're lacking. Think about this. The demon of lack gets you all stirred up. The demon of lack make you disrespectful. The demon of lack make you proud. The demon of lack make you arrogant. And then when it's all said and done, you don't got nothing. My people perish for lack. The knowledge came afterwards, but it was lack right there standing at the door, stopping the knowledge from coming, making you angry, making you disinterested, making you offended, making you criticized, making you judgmental. And then the knowledge never get to you. And then you lack and then you perish. Now, saints, perish is a word that means that you're declining. And sometimes you're declining gradually. So saints, most people that are perishing don't even know that they're perishing. Because it's not always obvious. It happens over time. And then you end up in a situation that you're in a pit. Let me say this to you. That's why children of God, you need wisdom where you exercise compassion. 
Because some people that are in situations are in situations because they entertain the demon of lack. They listen to the demon of lack. And now they see that their situation is at the rock bottom. But while they was in the traveling process there, they didn't see that. You see what I'm saying? Glory to God. So even you need wisdom of who you have compassion on. Because you see people after the demon of lack has finished them off. And you look at them and you say, oh, oh, oh I need to help them. Wait a minute. But is God helping them? Oh, you shocked? You think God helped everybody? My favorite book in the Bible, the book of Proverbs. You need wisdom in how you have compassion on people. Because if, if somebody is in the final state of their own decisions, and now they're at rock bottom, they need to learn. That's not for you to bail them out. They need to learn and humble themselves to get out. Not you bail them out. They need to go through a path, go through a process, and God has to break that hard-headedness. He got to break that stubborn spirit, that stubborn demon that they have, and they, got, they have to be delivered from foolishness because foolishness is, is the author of all lack. Foolishness. Foolishness. And so sometimes you see people in their predicament and they're crying. Oh, oh, oh. But what is the result of you getting here? Why did you get here? Did you get here because you're going through a process with God? Or, or did you get here because God was processing you and you said no? Hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. Did you get here because this is your cross? Or did you get here because you refused your cross and now this is, this is the penalty? Did you get here because you're learning instructions? Or did you get here because God was speaking instructions and you despise his instructions? Wow. Wow. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23. It says, turn at my reproof. You know what reproof really means? I'm going to give you my definition according to the wisdom that God has given me. Reproof means that God makes a confirmation to you. He proves to you that something is wrong and then you still reject it. You say, no, I just lean to my own understanding. It's like when you give people the word, you show them that the word said uh, what, 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 what. It's supposed to be, and then people still say, well, even though it says that, that's not what it means. Turn at my reproof mean I, I done gave you proof. I done opened up your eyes, and you still choose to be blind. I done exposed to you, and you still choose to be uh, ignorant. You choose, you choose the route of, uh, you know, even though you taught me, I still act like I don't know. Turn you at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. See, look at what the text is saying. The Lord is saying, I will pour out my spirit unto you. And some of you all say, well, how are you going to do that? He'll send a prophet to you. He'll send a messenger to you. Notice what he says here. I will pour out my spirit unto you. And watch this. I will make known to you my words. I will make my words known unto you. Look at what the Lord is saying here. He said, I'm going to pour out my spirit. And here's how you know that I'm pouring out my spirit. I'm going to make my words known to you. So saints, whoever is making God's words known to you is actually the outpouring of, your, of the spirit on your life. So how many people are missing revival? Do you know why America keep on praying for revival? Look at all the ministers that pray for revival all the time. Lord, send revival to our land. Why are we praying these prayers? Because people are rejecting the revival. <laughs> 
because they looking for the revival to come the way that they want it to come. And God saying, no, 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 I'm going to pour out my spirit, but I'm going to make my words known to you through who I want. So whoever is making the words of God known to you is the outpouring of the spirit. Can somebody, somebody track that and quote that for me so we can share that? Whoever is making the words of God known to you is the outpouring of the spirit. Because in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 23, it tells you that I will pour out my spirit unto you. And then as a result of that, I will make my words known to you. So the Lord said, I'm going to give you a revelation. The person giving you revelation, the person that's giving you divine knowledge, they are the outpouring of the spirit in your life. You have to do everything possible to stay linked to that person because this is how God is choosing to keep the flow of the spirit being poured out on you. You don't want another spirit being poured out on you. A spirit that's going to take you to hell. A spirit that's going to keep you in sin. A spirit that's going to keep you in debt. A spirit that's going to keep you in poverty. A spirit that's going to keep you in darkness. A spirit that's going to keep you in regret. A spirit that's going to keep you in bondage. It says that the person that is making the words known, I pour out my spirit unto you. Now watch this here. Verse 24 says this. Because I have called, I'm in Proverbs 1, 24, because I have called and you refused and I have stretched out my hands and you did not regard me. Look what it says here. Because you have set at naught my counsel in verse 25 and would have none of my reproof. Verse 26, this is the Lord talking. I will laugh at your calamity. I, oh my God. Wow, wow, wow. I will laugh at your calamity. Now, this is some scary stuff here. This is some scary stuff here. And I will mock you when your fear cometh. Look at verse 27. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish comes upon you. Do you know that there's people like that? When God's speaking to them through the messenger, they laugh, they joke, they clown. They think it's, they, 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 they casualize it. And then this hits. And so imagine you as a child of God, you see a person like that in this predicament and you start having compassion on them and you try to help them out of their situation. Imagine how foolish you are. Now you understand why I said you don't give to everybody just because they're going through something. Now you understand the statement and sometimes people be like, well, how do I know? Look what it says in verse 28. They shall call upon me and I will not answer. Do you know who's calling on you that God ain't even answering them? They calling on you to help them, but God ain't even answering them. So when you think that you God and you step in the place of trying to answer them. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know how scary that is? Now, now you go and go help somebody that God is ignoring. So what God going to do to you? Because God see you as if you're empowering somebody that he don't want to empower. They shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Let's go to verse 29. For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Verse 29. They would have none of my counsel and they despised all my reproof. Look at this, verse 31. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own ways and be filled with their own devices. Let 
Look at verse 23. Look at verse 33. But whosoever shall hearken unto me shall dwell safely and shall be protected from the fear of evil. I'm dealing with wealth here. When God makes you wealthy, be careful that you don't distribute the wealth just because you see people in need. You need wisdom and discernment to know what's really going on in this person's life. Is God judging them because he gave them an opportunity to come out and they laughed at God? They mocked God? They embarrassed God? They made God feel like he was nobody when he was reaching out for them and trying to bring them into his arms. They made him look like a fool. Or is this person someone that's being processed and God saying, okay, lend to them, bless them. You got to know where people are. And that's one of the most scariest things that been happening is that people, sometimes they can't see that somebody already was reached out by God. And God gave them an opportunity to change, gave them an opportunity to repent and do right by him. And they laughed and mocked God. And now they're in their, they're in their situation of judgment. Now they're crying out to you for you to help them. If God ain't talking to you, I, you sure ain't going to find me talking to you. And, and saints, I don't feel bad about situations like that because Everybody has more than enough of the mercy of God being distributed to them daily for them to make the right decision. But look what the word of God says. They did not choose the fear of the Lord in verse 29 and they hated knowledge. Do you know what hate knowledge mean? They hate the fact that God was taking the time to even correct them, give the instruction to them. They hated it. You see what I'm saying? You're going to have to learn that as a wealthy person. And, and see, what I'm telling right now, some of y'all might not understand. You might say, well, you know, I don't really need to hear this right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to need to hear this when God make you wealthy. When God make you rich, you're going to have to understand this. When God prosper you, you're going to have to understand this. Because there's going to be many people that's going to pop up and it look like you need to help their situation and you don't know which angle they coming from. You coming to me because you trying to run from God. No, baby. You going to get these hands. You going to get these hands. <laughs> the, the Bible said that it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And if God ain't helping you, I ain't going to help you. If God ain't answering your prayer, I ain't going to answer your prayer. If God ain't bailing you out, I'm not bailing you out. If God not delivering you, I'm not delivering you. If God not investing in you, I'm not investing in you. You have to know this, that some people are in their situation because God sent the man of God to them and they rejected the man of God. So now they're eating the fruit of their ways. That means even if they get homeless, that means even if they get sick, that means even if they get all this stuff. I'm telling you, look what the scripture says. The vocal thing that I'm telling you here is this. When people beg you for help, know which angle they're coming from. I, is this person being processed by God and they want God? Or is this person someone that mocked God when God wanted them? Is this someone that was laughing in his face when he was reaching out to them daily, momentarily, secondary, uh, in, in seconds? Were they someone that was scorning him and joking at him? Well, in that matter, lawfully, if you're not supposed to invest your finances in that person, because now you're helping God's enemy. And if you help God's enemy, you are God's enemy. And when God judges them, he will judge you because you kept them afloat. 
I, I, th I think, I think, I think, I think the precision of words that I have here, it will be, it will be a great disservice if you act like you don't understand me. You, you got to be on five special buses if you don't understand what I'm saying. I'm giving you scripture. Here. I'm showing you right here in the text. I'm showing you that some people are suffering because they don't listen to God. And when you don't listen to God, you will suffer. So when the suffering come and you crying and clinging for people, help me, help me, help me, help me. No, 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 no. That comes with the territory of your decisions. Now, God loves you so much that he going to reach out to you so much for a time. And that, saints, guess what? Do you know sometimes it's not even one year that God reach out? There'll be years that God reach out to people. And then they keep on laughing at God and making him feel like a fool. Imagine that. Imagine if God sends somebody to you and you up there make that person, make, make, make God look like he dumb and he don't know what he doing and he's stupid and you doing all that to God and God just sitting there taking it. All powerful God. He just taking it, taking it, taking it, taking it, taking it, taking it, just taking it, taking it, taking it, just forgiving, being merciful, just holding on, just turning his back, just closing his eyes, da, 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 da. just letting you chop off at the mouth, da, 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 da. just letting you do your thing, do your thing, do your thing, do your thing. And then calamity hit. I have never met anybody in my life that chopped off at God and didn't get hit. I, I have never met nobody. I promise I stand in the presence of God. And, and watch this. I know how God operates. God will wait 12 months before he say anything about anything. God will wait two years before he say anything about anything and then pop. And there's some people think, oh, no, no, God has forgiven me. Yeah. <laughs> you think, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he forgiving you in your way, but he going to judge you. Yeah, baby, he going to judge you. There's a realm in the spirit. The Bible says that if the wicked are recompensed on the earth, how much more the righteous? If the righteous are recompensed on the earth, Wait, I'm righteous. So why am I being recompensed? No, God dealing with you in the realm of righteousness. You knew better. So I'm going to deal with you on that realm of righteousness. God whoops now. He chastens. The Bible said those he loves, he chastens. Look at your children. You love your children. Do you not hit them when they acting out of control? Well, you have some form of discipline. It don't have to be a hit. You may take away a video game. You may stop them from watching TV. You may tell them that they cannot hang with their friends. You may tell them that they can't play on the football team no more. You may tell them that they can't eat that favorite food that you promised that you would give to them. You may tell them that you're not going to have no ice cream. You got some form of disciplinary system to let them know I'm dealing with you for what you did. <laughs> And I know how God operates. My daughter's in their glory homes. The other day she was she was on she was watching uh cartoons and the cartoons she got frustrated. And she th she threw the she threw the uh the she threw the electronic. So I said, Zendaya, I said, here, I'ma pick it up. I said, listen, you're not gonna have it. I said, Zendaya, you're not going to watch this. And Zendaya went go cry. And I explained to her, I said, listen, if you throw this, if that's going to be your reaction, it means that you can't have it. So watch this here. Zendaya was really sleepy. I know that as her parent, that she's cranky. She trying to watch the electronic because this is what she wants to do. So what I did was, I took the electronic. I said, Zendaya, you going to sleep. You going to sleep. <laughs> and within seconds, she was sleeping. Now, what the father told me, this is what she really needed, sleep. So, so he pointed me to the solution. And then watch this. When she wakes up, she not asking for the electronic or nothing. The Lord say, go give her the electronic. The discipline of God, if you yield to it, there's a reward. 
But you're going to have to be disciplined some way, some way, shape, or form. What I'm telling you is that there's people that when God disciplines them, they try to run and try to say, help me, help me, somebody help me. No, no, no. Take the discipline. Get it right with God. And if it be possible, you'll recover. But that's all up to you. God is a God of recovery. But you're going to have to catch those hands. You're going to have to catch those hands. You may try to run from it, but you're going to have to catch those hands. And nobody can bail you out of that. You catch those hands, you take it, and God in his love and mercy will pitch you back in his way. But it's not up to nobody. But you see the heart of the father. He give her back the electronics. Discipline, but give you back the electronics. How you yield to discipline is how you get back the electronics or you get back into the flow where you recover. But you don't recover by escaping the punishment. Saints, I'm going to tell you like this here. And let me warn some of you are on here. If you pitch your mouth on a man of God anywhere, even if that man of God, you think that that man of God is wrong, that woman of God is wrong. If you pitch your mouth on them, you break divine law. Anytime. If you ever find yourself stirring up people against a man of God, here's what you do. You sentence yourself for God to fight you in the future. He not going to fight you in the now. He going to let you do it. He going to let you feel good about it. And then he going to get you in an hour you think not. You going to take a punishment. If you deal with the punishment, it's like a plea deal. How many of you all know that rappers, when they get in trouble, they do the crime, they take a plea deal, they still have to serve. When they take the plea deal, they get a lesser sentence, but they still got to serve. And when they get out of jail, they be on probation. When they get out of jail, they be on all type of monitors for a time. Um, let me just say this. They're a young boy, M NBA young boy. He went to jail. They told him that he wasn't going to be able to perform all that nun stuff and he was going to be on probation. He complied with them. They took him off of probation. But that was what they said. You're going to get some hands. You did this and this and this. You're going to get some hands. I'm telling you, this world system, a lot of it is really based off of God's judicial system. And God uses this earth system to comply with his judicial system up there. He does that. So if you in the wrong down here, God will send cops. Or send natural, natural thing to restrain you. And that's the best way instead of him killing you and taking you to hell. Because remember what Jesus said, don't fear him that try to kill your body, but fear him that can kill your body and your soul and cast it into hell. Jesus was saying people down here, they can just destroy your body, but fear him that can destroy your body and your soul and cast it into the lake of fire. So, a lot of times the Lord himself uses people down here to quicken you. You see what I'm saying? And how you deal with that. But you're you, you going you gonna to take some hits. And raise your children to fear men of God. The greatest thing that you can train your child is how to deal with divine presence. Train your children how to talk when, when the presence of a man of God is there. Train your children. We do not have many parents that train their children how to respect men and women of God. And that's why the generation grows up to be on Facebook and be on YouTube and all type of social media sites slandering men of God because nobody taught them. Nobody told them that if you talk about a man of God today, five years later, you might be in a car accident. And people see you and say, wow, was this person killed in the car accident? No, no, because five years ago, they was talking about a man of God. People get stricken with cancer and diseases 10 years from when they was talking about a woman of God. And, and they're like, how did this person just all of a sudden get sick? Because they violated a divine law. Touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. That means that even if you think a prophet is wrong, leave them alone. Don't talk about them. Keep their name out, out your mouth. 
because there's always a sentence that comes with our decisions. And those sentences don't hit us when we think that they're going to hit us. They hit us later on. Train your children to respect the anointing. If you have children right now, stop teaching them A, B, C, D, E, F, G so much and teach them that when God shows up through a man, through a woman, and he's speaking to you, this is how you respond. This is how you act. Teach them what they really need to know. The world going to teach them how to read, spell, all that stuff. You're going you to all these different philosophies. Teach them the spirit realm. Some parents get extremely excited when they see their child make all A's in school. They get extremely excited. And that's, that's you know, my, my child is an honor roll student. Honor roll, honor roll. But which honor roll really matters? If I get honor roll in the natural school, but I don't get honor roll in the spiritual school, am I really accomplished? And as a parent, am I really in the right place if my child succeeds in the world, but they don't succeed in the word? Am I really accomplished? What have I accomplished? My child succeeds in this world system, but they don't succeed in this word system. Have I really accomplished? The word of God talks about that the little children was looking at Elisha and saying, go up, body, go up, body. Do you think that these children had parents that taught them that if you talk to a prophet of God like that? No. And since there's a generational curse amongst men and women that don't train their children of how to fear God. There's a generational curse that happens. There's another generation that continues the cycle of Satanism. And nobody comes into the gospel power of God. Nobody comes into true deliverance and true freedom. Nobody comes into true joy and true peace and true happiness. And they grow up and their marriages fail. And they grow up and their health fail. And they grow up and their finances fail. They grow up and their life fail. They grow up and they end up in hell. They grow up and they end up with the gates of hell prevail against them. And all these things occur in a cycle and nobody breaks it. And you, oh woman of God, you, oh man of God, the Lord will pit you in a position to break the cycle that kept going from generation to generation and kill the spirit of witchcraft and destroy the spirit of sorcery and cancel the spirit of demons that move through mankind and make them enemies of God. And the Lord will pit you there to fix it. What's a good parent? What's a, what's a good person? They're a good person because they went to school. They're a good person to society because they work a nine to five. Wow. That's what a good person has become. But we wonder why doctors can go to school for years and then be found for treacherous murderers all across their house, all across their neighborhood. And we wonder, uh, this person has so many degrees. Why were they a killer? Why were they raping women in secret? Why were they destroying little children and pedophiles? Why was this happening? Because that's not the true goodness. The true goodness is when one believes this word of God. The true goodness is one when they become a do of the word. When they start standing on the scriptures and training others to do it as well. When they start seeing evil and they start recommending that someone comes to the Lord to find out what they can become, the freedom they can walk in, the joy they can obtain, the wisdom they can walk in, the power that they can move in, and they start becoming an advocate for the gospel. That's when the real goodness comes through a person. The goodness is not all the other things. The goodness is when you become a voice that trains someone else to fear God. Saints, you ever been in the presence of gossipers? Not one has the wisdom to create peace. Have you ever noticed that? Sit amongst five gossipers and find out which one is the creator of peace. Not one. Because the spirit of gossip don't work like that. The spirit of gossip is a spirit of hatred in manifestation. 
is a spirit of division that loves to see drama occur. Nobody has the wisdom of God or the peace of God to say, hey, nobody can train the other of how to respond to the scenario because all are in darkness. When you become a good person, you will train other people to fear God. Listen to what I'm saying. Here's the vocal point in this. When you are a good person, you will train people to fear God. So if this violates the scriptural reaction, don't do it. Don't do it. And saints, let me just tell you this. Be careful of people that rile you up to be evil and give you reasons. No, no, no. All these reasons could go. But what did Jesus do on the cross? Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Look how Jesus responded. All these people were in the wrong. None of them had the right to do what they did to Jesus. None of them. Because Jesus was not a criminal. But Jesus took the place and look at his scriptural response. And so in every situation in your life is always the scriptural response to walk in humility, the fear of God, forgive, and move in the spirit of meekness. That means teachability. Let the Lord teach you how to go about things. If you go to people that are not even blessed, you go to people that have no anointing to counsel you on what decisions you should make. Do you really believe that you're prophetic? Imagine I go to people that are unrestrained, have no wisdom, have no favor, have no joy, have no peace, have no flow of the spirit. And I go to them and I seek them for, I, I place them as my counselors. Am I really prophetic? Wow. Wow. If I go to people that are carnal, that are compulsive, that are sensual, that are fleshly, and I deem them as my counselors for divine decisions. Wow. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 2, verse 11. Discretion shall preserve thee. Discretion shall preserve thee. What is it preserving thee from? It says, understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man. Chapter 12. From the man that speaks froward things. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? It's talking about here that discretion shall preserve thee. Pray for discretion. You know what discretion is all about? Discretion will have you look at situations from the point of God and say, this is evil. I'm not going to entertain this. I'm not going to give no place to this. Discretion will let you know what you're supposed to observe, what you're supposed to entertain, and what you're supposed to not let in your system. Look what it say right here. Discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee. Watch this, verse 12. To deliver thee from the way of the evil man. The evil man. Who is the evil man? The contrary man. The man that's not subject to the spirit. The man that does not listen to the word of God for reactions. The man that does not seek the wisdom of God for decisions. The evil man is the man that is against God's mindset. To deliver thee from the evil man. So an evil man is someone that you have to be delivered from. Because they are aggressively pursuing your, your attentiveness. You have to be delivered from an evil man because an evil man will constantly spew venom and poison into your system.
Now, see, you can't even be rich until you be delivered from the evil man. Because the evil man wants you to stay broke. You can't even be wealthy until you be delivered from an evil man. You can't even have prosperity until you be delivered from an evil man. Because they're always going to speak to you against your prophet. And your prophet is the prosperity carrier for your life. No profit, no success in God. According to divine law, if you don't have a prophet of God, you will not have any success. So imagine if I don't have deliverance from an evil man, it's going to stop all my finances. It's going to stop all my wealth. It's going to stop all my abundance. It's going to stop all my joy. It's going to stop all my peace. It's going to stop all my happiness. The evil man does not leave voluntarily. The evil man will call you on the phone, text you. The evil man will message you. The evil man will keep on communicating. You got to be delivered from the evil man. There's a deliverance anointing that got to take place if you won't get free from the evil man. The evil man studies you. The evil man watches you from a distance. The evil man knows when you're asleep. The evil man knows when you're awake. Because the evil man has made it their assignment to watch you. How will you have victory until you're delivered from the evil man? The evil man is just like the strong man. Locking up your goods. The evil man. You got to break free from the evil man if you're going to live this God type of life. The, the evil man is going to be the one that is sent by the devil to keep you in the flesh. Keep you in the spirit of iniquity. But these two anointings said that it'll break it. It says discretion and understanding. Here's the word of God right here. You have the anointing. You have the message of the gospel here. You have the anointing. Father, I pray right now and I receive the anointing and the spirit of discretion and the anointing and the spirit of understanding. The Bible says that these two anointings right here, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the revelation here. It, it, these two, will deliver you from the evil man. So saints, you wonder why you have so much momentum to follow your man of God. You have so much momentum to stay in the spirit. You have so much momentum to walk in the wisdom of God. It's because you have understanding and discretion operating in your soul. That's proof that you got discretion and understanding operating in your soul because you have these two realms, discretion and understanding. That's how you know that you have been delivered from the evil man because now you have discretion and understanding operating in your soul. Now, saints, you got to pray for discretion and understanding this year. This is a prophetic word. You're going to have to pray for discretion and understanding this year. If you're going to make it this year and be successful and obtain the money that God wants you to have, because saints, imagine there's money that God has prescribed for you this year. Imagine that there's money bags, there's money trucks that's supposed to visit your home, your location where you abide. There's prosperity angels that's supposed to move with you this year. There's financial justice that's supposed to occur for you this year. You're supposed to see increase. Your income is supposed to have a different outcome. So you're going to need discretion and understanding to get you there. You're going to have to receive this anointing at discretion and understanding if you're going to get there this year. You don't want to cut yourself short. Discretion and understanding is required. Go after discretion and understanding this year. Go after discretion. Discretion lets you know what you're not supposed to have in your system. Discretion shows you what you're not supposed to entertain. Discretion gives you advance discernment of what you are not supposed to be taught. 
discretion will expose an ungodly counselor to you. Who is counseling you that God is not counseling them to counsel you? And who is counseling you that's canceling the divine you? Who's counseling you that is canceling the divine you? So, so the you that's anointed can't come forth. Praise God. Praise God. Who is speaking to you that when God speaks to you, his words are casualized and not being heeded, respected, or brought in? Think about that. Whose words is removing the effectiveness of God's words from your soul, from your reaction? Break away from that company that does not fear God. Stop hanging around other women and other men that don't love God. Stop thinking that you're winning them to the Lord by being close to them. Keep them at a distance. If you want to win them to God, win them from God at a distance. Stop hanging out with them. Saints, I'm going to tell you as a wise man, listen to what I'm saying to you. When you bring people close to you and you think that that's how you're going to win them to God, they're actually corrupting you more than you're cleansing them. They're corrupting you, their presence, their mindsets. The way that they view life, the way that they view decisions is destroying you. And you don't know that it's destroying you. You got that girlfriend that always drinks, always parties, and you bring them close to you and you say, I'm winning her to the Lord. No, no, no. She's winning you to the devil. Her atmosphere, her company is demonic. Keep that girl at a distance. Don't bring her close to you. Her lifestyle is not profitable to your soul, to your flow with God, to your future, to your finances, to your mindset. Keep her at a distance. Don't bring her near you. Don't have conversations where you and her are close in distance and you just conversating casually. Keep that, keep, keep that hussy at a distance. Don't bring her close. Don't talk about you winning her to God and she right next to you. You destroying yourself. Her demons will talk to you in the night. And you may say that that's not true. Yeah. Uh-huh. I, I, I live life. And God let me live life for me to give you the wisdom that you need. Your thoughts may think. You may think that you're in the spirit with your thoughts. Her thoughts will link up with your thoughts in an hour you think not. Don't let her around you. People that are in witchcraft are deadly. You say, who are in witchcraft? It's not just somebody blowing no smoke or blowing on, no, no, no. Or driving in no broom, on no broom in the night. People that are in witchcraft are people that's in rebellion to the will of God for their life. They're in rebellion to the word. They're in rebellion to faith. They're in rebellion to focusing on Jesus. They're in rebellion to praising God, thanking God, listening for God, pursuing the Lord. They're in rebellion to all those things. That's what people in witchcraft are. If you get around somebody that's in witchcraft, meaning they're in rebellion to the things of God, the ways of God, the pursuit of God, if they're not running after Jesus, they are causing you to run away from Jesus, even by presence and proximity. Even just being around them is causing you to drift away from God. You're becoming lukewarm just by being around someone that's not on fire for God. Just by being around them. You can say, I still read my Bible. I, I still pray in tongues. I still keep myself covered. You can't keep yourself covered when you're around a presence of a person that God does not want you around. You cannot keep yourself covered when you are connected to people that's not connected to God. You cannot keep yourself covered when you're in conversations with people that do not have wisdom. They do not have divine knowledge. They do not have divine counsel flowing inside of them. The wonderful counselor is not counseling them. You cannot stay on fire for God around people like that. 
You'll wonder why you still got struggles and urges and all type of stuff that bother you. It's connected to somebody that's not connected to God. The fact that you're still connected to them is arousing your mind into places it's not supposed to be. If you're around witchcraft and around rebellion and around disobedience, dishonor, if you're around distraction, you're receiving an impartation from that person. That person cannot give you Jesus. Therefore, when Jesus is inside of you, he's being suffocated. He's being ignored. He's being damaged from functioning in your decisions, in your emotions, in your mindset. Your emotions will catch up to you in the demonic, even if you don't disconnect from them. If you don't disconnect from them, you wonder why one day you, you wake up depressed, discouraged. You start questioning God if God 